nature based solutions for the world to intensify our response to climate change. What is a nature based solution? Nature based solutions are ways of managing our forests, land, soils, oceans, agriculture, and food. Food management can help reduce emissions, remove carbon from the atmosphere, and store it. The science is clear. Implementing nature-based solutions globally and at scale can deliver up to one-third of the climate solution. Nature is a fundamental part of our climate change solution. It is, at scale, affordable and has immediate impact. Nature-based solutions are not just about carbon. Nature-based solutions can help communities adapt. Climate Action Summit is a golden opportunity to unlock the potential of nature. What outcomes on nature-based solutions do we need from the Climate Action Summit? First, we need to recognize the value of nature for climate mitigation and resilience and its multiple socioeconomic and environmental benefits. Second, we need to give a powerful signal to increase ambitions on nature-based solutions in nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, long-term strategies, and investments. Third, we need to launch a concrete plan to follow up on all of these political commitments. What have we heard from partners and proponents? Nature-based solutions are effective. Nature-based solutions are grounded on interventions happening on forests, land, food, agriculture, and oceans. They involve and benefit more than 7 billion people. The Nature-Based Solutions proposition for the Climate Action Summit builds on inputs from all sectors of society. We have received more than 140 inputs from government, civil society, NGOs, academia, the private sector, and international organizations. And these are evidence of the action that's already happening across the globe. These are the tangible examples of what can be scaled up in the future, and this is just the beginning. Achieving the full potential from nature-based solutions involves all of us. Look around you. The momentum for nature-based solutions is growing. Thank you to everyone who has contributed so far. The potential is here and is real. It is clear that great potential requires action at a great scale. The time has come for nature-based solutions to be scaled up where it matters, everywhere. The climate is changing rapidly. Climate change poses an existential threat to all countries and all people. Climate change undermines the security of future generations. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. What can we do? How long do we have? The window for an effective response is getting smaller and smaller. Nature can come to the rescue. Nature-based solutions can enable the world to intensify our response to climate change. What is a nature-based solution? Nature-based solutions are ways of managing our forests, land, soils, oceans, agriculture, and food. Food management can help reduce emissions, remove carbon from the atmosphere, and store it. The science is clear. Implementing nature-based solutions globally and at scale can deliver up to one-third of the climate solution. Nature is a fundamental part of our climate change solution. It is, at scale, affordable and has immediate impact. Nature-based solutions are not just about carbon. Nature-based solutions can help communities adapt to climate change. They can lift a billion people out of poverty and create 80 million jobs, adding over two trillion to the global economy. All win-win solutions. The Climate Action Summit is a golden opportunity to unlock the potential of nature. What outcomes on nature-based solutions do we need from the Climate Action Summit? First, we need to recognize the value of nature for climate mitigation and resilience and its multiple socioeconomic and environmental benefits. Second, we need to give a powerful signal to increase ambitions on nature-based solutions in nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, long-term strategies, and investments. Third, we need to launch a concrete plan to follow up 
on all of these political commitments. What have we heard from partners and proponents? Nature-based solutions are effective. Nature-based solutions are grounded on interventions happening on forests, land, food, agriculture, and oceans. They involve and benefit more than seven billion people. The Nature-Based Solutions Proposition for the Climate Act
all people. Climate change undermines the security of future generations. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. What can we do? How long do we have? The window. Good evening. We're just about to start. If you could find your seat, please. The climate is changing rapidly. Climate change poses an existential threat to all countries and all people. Climate change undermines the security of future generations. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. What can we do? How long do we have? The window for an effective response is getting smaller and smaller. Nature can come to the rescue. Nature-based solutions can enable the world to intensify our response to climate change. What is a nature-based solution? Nature-based solutions are ways of managing our forests, land, soils, oceans, agriculture, and food. Food management can help reduce emissions, remove carbon from the atmosphere, and store it. The science is clear. Implementing nature-based solutions globally and at scale can deliver up to one-third of the climate solution. Nature is a fundamental part of our climate change solution. It is, at scale, affordable and has immediate impact. Nature-based solutions are not just about carbon. Nature-based solutions can help communities adapt to climate change. They can lift a billion people out of poverty and create 80 million jobs, adding over two trillion to the global economy. All win-win solutions. The Climate Action Summit is a golden opportunity to unlock the potential of nature. What outcomes on nature-based solutions do we need from the Climate Action Summit? First, we need to recognize the value of nature for climate mitigation and resilience and its multiple socioeconomic and environmental benefits. Second, we need to give a powerful signal to increase ambitions on nature-based solutions in nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, long-term strategies, and investments. Third, we need to launch a concrete plan to follow up on all of these political commitments. What have we heard from partners and proponents? Nature-based solutions are effective. Nature-based solutions are grounded on interventions happening on forests, land, food, agriculture, and oceans. They involve and benefit more than seven billion people. The nature-based solutions proposition for the Climate Action Summit builds on inputs from all sectors of society. We have received more than 140 inputs from government, civil society, NGOs, academia, the private sector, and international organizations. And these are evidence of the action that's already happening across the globe. These are the tangible examples of what can be scaled up in the future, and this is just the beginning. Achieving the full potential for nature-based solutions involves all of us. Look around you. The momentum for nature-based solutions is growing. Thank you to everyone who has contributed so far. The potential is here and is real. It is clear that great potential requires action at a great scale. The time has come for nature-based solutions to be scaled up where it matters, everywhere. Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Gardner. I'm the director of the Ecosystems Division here in the UN Environment Program. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you tonight on behalf of UNEP and the CBD Secretariat to this briefing session on nature-based solutions on the work stream of the United Nations Secretary General's Climate Action Summit. 
So thank you all very much, those of you who have found the time to be here this evening after a very long, intense day at the first open-ended working group meeting of the post-2020 process. It's a pleasure to see so many people in the room, focal points for the conservation and biological diversity participating in this OEWG, and members of the Committee of Permanent Representatives to UNEP, as well as all of those, uh, I'd like to extend a greeting to those on the webcam uh, who are watching remotely. Uh, there's so much energy and enthusiasm in terms of nature-based solutions, we wanted to make sure that this was webcast globally. Indeed, as we've seen this interest growing, uh, we want to take advantage of this gathering, and it's, so this is being live streamed and recorded uh, so that we can disseminate it more broadly to our community. The purpose of this session today is to share updates on the work and the developments of the Nature-Based Solutions Coalition in the context of the Secretary General's Climate Action Summit, as well as to have an exchange of views on how the Nature-Based Solutions work stream can effectively build through the Secretary uh, General's Climate Action Summit to the CBD COP15 in October 2020. So first, please allow me to just briefly outline the structure of this session. We have a wonderful panel, as you can see, with, with us here today that consists of representatives from China and New Zealand as the co-leads for the Nature-Based Solutions track of the Climate Action Summit. And from the two host organizations, we have the honor to have with us the Executive Secretary of the CBD and the Executive Director of UNEP. We'll set the stage by hearing from our panelists and then we'll open the floor for an interactive dialogue and an exchange of views. We highly value your input, your comments, and your suggestions, and we look forward to hearing from you. We are aware that some of you have other commitments um, that you have to attend to directly after this session, so we will in, uh, intend to uh, close the session right at 7.15. But for those of you who are able to stay a little longer, we would welcome uh, the time to have more of an intimate uh, discussion. So let me set the stage by sharing with you some of the background on the Climate Action Summit and how far we've come on nature-based solutions in this process so far today. You'll hear more about this as well from the panelists. But as you know, the Secretary General is convening the Climate Action Summit on the 23rd of September this year to mobilize political and economic actors at the highest levels. The summit will aim to boost ambition and accelerate actions to implement the Paris Agreement goals and to demonstrate transformative economic actions in support of these goals. In preparation for the summit and in order to ensure transformative outcomes from the summit, the Secretary General has identified nine independent action areas which the co and coalitions have been established around these areas. One of these is nature-based solutions and it's this coalition is co-led by China and New Zealand and supported by UNEP, the CBD, and David Navarro. It's been such a pleasure to work with this impressive group. And I can personally just say I'd like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude uh, for all of the, the work, the leadership, the collaborative spirit, and the guidance that the co-lead countries, our facilitators, and the many partners have contributed in joining this process. So just as a bit of background, there was an open call for contributions to the Nature-Based Solutions Workstream over a short period of time, and it generated over 180 initiatives and good practices that provide an excellent illustration of the energy that there is and the critical mass of actions and evidence that nature-based solutions are real. They're ready to be scaled up, and to meet the climate and bi biodiversity challenges that we're facing today. Building on the inputs that we received through this process, a nature-based solutions manifesto has emerged, and you'll hear more about this from the co-leads. You can find the manifesto online at the nature-based solutions uh, web platform hosted on the UNEP website, um, and as well as there are copies in the back of the room for you that are here in the room. So now it's my pleasure to give the floor to the panelists. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Xu Hong Kui, Director General of the Department for Nature and Ecology Conservation of the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, 
and Mrs. Rosemary Patterson, the Director of Environmental Division, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, representing the Nature-Based Solutions co-leads from the countries of China and New Zealand, who have provided remarkable leadership to this process. Mr. Kui, you have the floor, please. Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to be here to, together with colleagues from New Zealand, uh, from, uh, with the executive uh, director from UNAP and also the executive secretary from uh, uh, CBD. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the progress we have achieved regarding the nature-based solutions uh, uh, for the Climate Action Summit 2019 to be conducted by the UN Secretary General uh, next uh, in, in September, as well as to share with you thoughts and practices of China regarding MBS. Uh, 我们希望与各方加强沟通，建立更加密切的合作关系，进一步做好基于自然的解决方案领域成果设计和活动组织等相关工作。During the past months, with the support from a wide range of stakeholders, we have achieved significant progress on the MBS Working Group. We have received like more than 150 contributions from different stakeholders, and we have worked closely with New Zealand on the drafting of MBS manifesto. And uh, uh, my colleague, Rosemary, will give an uh, introduction about this manifesto later. We sincerely express our appreciation to UNAP and others for providing technical support to us, and we hope to continue this work with the support from all of you to improve the organizing and pursue uh, to a good outcome. 在这里, 我把... 参与基于自然的解决方案工作的一些体会，与大家分享一下。基于自然的解决方案提供了联合国气候变化与生物多样性公约协协同增效的机遇。Here, uh, I'd like to share some of my uh, feelings about a nature-based solution uh, with all of you. Uh, first of all, I think that nature-based solutions provides a very good opportunity. For, uh, to form the synergy between climate change and uh, biodiversity conservation. So,MBS uh, plays a very important role both to deal with climate change and also the biodiversity uh, conservation. Um, they are embedded interlinkages between these two. So, uh, 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 China would like to uh, do its best to implement the nature-based solutions. And we would also like to cooperate with the international community to uh, learn the successful experiences and also to share China's experience in this field. 
uh, for China, we think that uh, human and nature, in fact, form a life community, and we should respect nature, follow the rules of nature, and also protect nature. 我想重点分享一下中国划定并严守生态保护红线的有关经验没有受到有效的保护 uh, Here I'd like to share some of uh, China's experience um, I would like to talk a little bit about the drawing of ecological redlining in China uh, In China we have already implemented the in-situ conservation uh, uh, system with uh, 2,750 uh, protected uh, uh, nature reserves of various types and levels, covering a total area of 1.47 uh, million square kilometers, uh, which um, accounting for 14.86% uh, of the land area of China. However, there are still many areas with important ecological uh, uh, functions or ecologically fragile region that haven't been effectively protected. Uh,为了解决这些保护不充分的问题,中国提出通过划定生态保护红线,吸收基于自然解决方案的思路,将全国生态功能最重要,生态环境最敏感的区域保护起来,提升生态系统固碳功能,为减缓气候变化,维护生
cooperation and exchange of uh, ideas with these uh, stakeholders in this regard. Uh,我很欣喜地看到，在基于自然的解决方案有关工作中，我们得到了全世界广泛的支持。我们已经收到了各方提交的内容丰富的倡议和行动，涉及到基于自然的解决方案的各个领域，提供了减缓和信气候变
they're more likely to attract investment. Secondly, we can unlock nature's full potential by enhancing international and regional cooperation on nature-based solutions, including where there are synergies with other issues, and particularly with a view to delivering the SDGs. High environmental integrity is really important in this area. Thirdly, we can generate shifts in national and international finance that value nature properly. This can be about ensuring that investment doesn't promote deforestation or other damaging practices. It includes green finance and promoting green supply chains. And fourthly, we can scale up nature-based solutions in some key sectors, <coughs> forests and terrestrial ecosystems, oceans and freshwater, food systems and agriculture, and through enhancing nature's systemic role in development. And we can ensure that people are supported through the transitions to a sustainable low emissions future, including people in rural environments. So, what the Secretary General wants to know for the 23rd of September is what signals will you be able to give? As we've been working on nature-based solutions, it became clear that there need to be systemic approaches so that many actions working together add up to systemic improvement. In forests and landscapes, the system's response includes preventing deforestation, enhancing protections, restoration of ecosystems. In agriculture and food, that means investment in science, production processes, greening the supply chain, dealing with food loss and, and waste. In oceans, that includes planting mangroves, protecting coral reefs, and strengthening the resilience of fisheries and aquaculture. We've been thinking about the barriers to systemic approaches and the tools needed to unlock nature's potential, including investment, measurement, and science. After all, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And when we looked at the 158 proposals, we came to realize an important couple of issues. Firstly, we know that there are countries who would like to include nature in their plans, but are unsure how to do so. So we're asking countries to tell us if that's the case, and we aim to link them up with assistance. Secondly, it became clear that the summit cannot be a once-only platform to, for nature-based solutions. So we're looking at a legacy that takes forward the issue and the proposals we've received, giving them platforms for showcasing and experience sharing. We invite interested countries, organizations, and companies to take leadership on this. And thirdly, we think there may be interest in establishing a group of friends of nature-based solutions to take the agenda forward. So we're asking for indications of interest in discussing the idea further. Nature may currently be an overlooked piece of climate action, but its strength is that every person has a relationship with nature. It resonates with every country and every national or cultural worldview. In my country, we have the concept of kaitiakitanga, which is recognized in law and describes the guardianship responsibility of humans towards the natural world of which they are part. You will each have your own relationship with nature your own world view of the role it plays in your life. And so we believe that the message of nature-based solutions will reach beyond the UN to people around the world. So the message is, don't ring fence nature. It's not something that should be include, excluded from climate action, but something to place at the heart of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Patterson, for those inspiring remarks and articulating so well this commitment and this opportunity. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Inger Anderson, UNEP Executive Director. Please. Thank you very much, and allow me first to thank the two co-facilitators, um, China and New Zealand, who've done an absolutely stellar job in shepherding through what is a complex and uh, multi-dimensional process uh, with many um, uh, interests and with a great degree of enthusiasm. 
I have to say that at the Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, no, we were in Abu Dhabi, <laughs> Abu Dhabi preparatory uh, meeting for the summit, uh, it was observed that the nature-based solutions track had standing room only, and it felt like a revivalist meeting because many, many people around the table and in standing room for the full day said that finally nature's role in climate mitigation and climate adaptation had been seen, not just as an add-on, but as a central piece uh, to solve the sustainability question, including the climate question. We are facing uh, these challenges that we all know, and the 2020 year will be, as we refer to it at times, a super year. Why? It is, of course, the year when the 2020 framework comes into effect, but it is also the year when the climate, when the Paris Accord goes into effect. Many other things happen too that year, including uh, the COP, of the two COPs, the World Conservation Congress and the Portugal Oceans Congre uh, Conference. So, but this is really where we need to deliver. And there are a number of people who have recently become um, aware of the story around nature-based solutions, but it may be useful to say that there are some definitionals that defines it and have been defined by member states and broader community. In the IUCN, uh, a resolution was passed in 2016 by member states, your, your presence was very much there, and by the NGO community, defining nature-based solutions as actions to protect and sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystem to address both societal well-being and nature's needs. The EU has similarly taken nature-based solutions on board and speaks to it as, an, an, um, as uh, a function that helps to address uh, a variety of environmental, social and economic challenges in a sustainable way. We here at UNEP take that entirety on, on board and speak to and see nature as a way to resolve societal challenges for the benefits of both society and nature. And so we know now that looking at it in this way, nature is, of course, a critical part of the climate puzzle. We've seen from studies that we have to reduce, um, and the nature holds the potential to reduce 12 gigatons of emissions. That, ladies and gentlemen, is equivalent to the entire emissions load from the current coal-fired power plants that we have today. And so, by investing in nature, not only are we getting the return to biodiversity, we are getting a breathing room as we decarbonize towards 2050. And that's where our forests, our lands, and our oceans come in. Now, the oceans will uptake our carbon whether we like it or not. Um, and that is obviously not what we want to see in, because that will lead to acidification, which is why it's all the more important that we invest in the terrestrial infrastructure. I'm talking about nature's infrastructure here so that that carbon can be absorbed by biomass in, on terrestrial biomass. We know that the incentives are skewed in our economies, skewed towards um, essentially taxing the goods and externalizing the bads, the bads being toxicity, emissions, etc. Those are left on the public purse or are left to be picked up by society, as we are seeing now by climate change. But the good thing is that we have really multiple um, solutions and the solutions are providing win-win opportunities. So let me try to give texture to what nature-based solutions could look like. Let's talk about land. We know that there is a huge um, challenge on land degradation with about uh, one to three billion people who are living on degraded land, about two billion hectares of degraded land. That presents an opportunity for restoration. And as some of us are packing our bags to go to the third Rio Conventions COP that will take place in India early uh, September, um, 
it becomes very important. That is a convention that has underlined land degradation neutrality. And so not only do we see nature-based solutions as a win for biodiversity, a win for climate change, it is most certainly also a win for the, a win for the desertification convention. If we talk about cities for a moment, we, we see, for example, that Europe, as an example, loses 3% of its GDP due to loss of biodiversity, but we can absolutely invest in urban regeneration and urban biological diversity. Not only will there be a return to better and healthier cities, we will also have better urban living. Cities like Medellin that uh, in Colombia have managed to reduce by two degrees the heating in the city simply by turning urban concrete jungles into green spaces. Those two degrees make for more livable, more friendly, and so crime statistics tell us, safer cities. Let's talk about energy. Clearly we are aware that as the climate is heating, we are seeing greater investments. I will not go into renewables, I just want to focus on cooling as an example. We are seeing ever greater investments in air conditioning and cooling. And we can project into 2050 with the rising temperatures that cooling investments will go up and, will, and that we will have a cooling stock that is massive. So 10 new air conditioners every second for the next 30 years is what is being projected. Now, not only will that provide huge carbon emissions, but here we know investing in nature-based solutions and cities will bring down exactly a part of the temperature load in dense urban settings. And of course, my second to last example here, resilience. We know that our coastal forests, our sand dunes, our coral reefs, our estuaries, our waterways, our wetlands, and, and uh, our uh, peatlands, and obviously our tropical forests and our other temperate forests are part of the solution to a changing climate, to intensive storms. And econ economics tells us that investing in nature's infrastructure is two to five times cheaper than investing in hard infrastructure, in engineered infrastructure. And finally, on health. Each year, about 12.6 million people die from air pollution. But when we turn green spaces, uh, turn urban spaces or de degraded spaces into green spaces, that leads to the natural absorption of what we do, uh, of dust and natural calming of the environment and better uh, living conditions. Not only that, it also improves our mental health, our well-being, our happiness, and with mobility and walking in green, we also reduce cardiovascular and diabetes. So there are so many wins that we can get from investing in nature, so that's why we absolutely need to think about nature uh, based solutions. And it's these multiple wins that weaves through um, the transboundary, the integrated opportunity that nature based solutions get. Because when we get nature right, when we get nature right, we also have the opportunity to getting climate right, to getting transboundary species right, to getting biodiversity right, and to getting land degradation and desertification right. And we can twist this around so that the economic drivers drive us in the right direction as opposed to in the wrong direction. We have seen plenty of examples from that. And this will also provide for an integrated narrative, not just between the eight, amongst the eight uh, biodiversity-related multilateral environment agreements, but beyond into the, the chemical agreements and certainly into climate change. And that will demonstrate that nature-based solutions is part of a multilateral package that works. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anger, for helping us to visualize with these concrete examples the great potential of nature-based solutions. And now for our final panelists, the CBD Executive Secretary, Ms. Christiana Pasca Palmer, since 2018, the CBD Secretariat has been involved in a consultative process of the deep dive meetings in support of the Climate Summit. 
And at the start of this year, the Secretary General invited Christiana to serve as a member of the steering committee for the 2019 Climate Summit. The CBD's work in generating a better understanding of the importance of nature-based solutions in the context of the climate agenda has been extremely constructive. So Christiana, I thank you and the CBD Secretariat for all your efforts to engage different communities of actors, governments, civil society, and the private sector to leverage their voices in their networks by different means and to support the nature agenda and demonstrate that achieving zero emissions and resilient development pathways, nature must be included as part of the climate ambition. So now I look forward to hearing your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, and uh, good evening to all of you. Indeed, this has been an, an extraordinary journey, and I'm very excited that now, together with, with Inger and Susan and our uh, great uh, co-chairs for this initiative from China and New Zealand, we have an opportunity to share with you uh, what has been achieved and where are we heading. Um, I was asked to, to actually answer the question of how the nature-based solution work can contribute to our post-2020 process and indeed the process of developing this uh, global <coughs> post-2020 global uh, biodiversity framework uh, culminating in, in Kunming in China next year. And I think it, it contributes in multiple, multiple ways. Um, and I would try to build on, on uh, what Inger was also mentioning in terms of very concrete examples. But let me start by, um, I think, one of the, what I consider a very impactful contribution, and that's the fact that the climate community now is awakening, is recognizing, it's giving value and voice to nature as one of the low-hanging fruits in trying to address the climate uh, crisis. And uh, indeed, we, you know, studies indicate that uh, about 30% of the uh, CO2 emission reductions would come from nature if we do it right. Now, that's a message that maybe just a few couple of climate change cops ago would have not resonated with the community, but I think through this journey in, uh, in the last year and under the great leadership of the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, um, we are, we are um, sort of, you know, cracking new, new ground there. The second element that I think is critically important, it has helped um, change the narrative and change the conversation. Because now we associate nature with solutions. Usually we talk about biodiversity in terms of crisis, in terms of extinction, in terms of problem, in terms of disaster and, you know, what's, what's waiting for us ahead. This is a, an optimistic perspective. Um, it's a practical and pragmatic perspective which indicates that there are solutions out there. And the fact that just the term nature-based solution, it's, it's emphasizing that. Um, in that. In that regard, I think the work, and I would like to, to recognize the work of all of you in the Biodiversity Convention for the past 25 years, have greatly contributed to arriving at this moment, and I know you will greatly contribute to moving this um, paradigm shift and this approach even further. And I also want to recognize the great work that we have done with our partners and colleagues from, from UNEP and the two leading countries in, in this effort. And uh, Susan in particular and David Nabarro, we've been through many calls together to, to develop it. Now, um, the second element or the third element in, in, this, in this relation is that our, our global biodiversity policy uh, framework, it's a party-led process. It's a process and a policy that is, as we are hearing from you, uh, based on science, based on science also that's coming from indigenous communities and traditional knowledge. It's built on experiences, and in fact, perhaps, it's time to also recognize that nature-based solutions are not necessarily a new concept. They, it may be new for, for certain communities, but if we look at indigenous people, their life experience is um, rooted in nature, and they, I think they discovered the concept of nature-based solution long time ago. But as we are moving forward in designing the policy and talking, and this afternoon I, I heard many of you um, uh, providing the statements on the mainstreaming of biodiversity and the need to build on decisions that we have from COP13 and COP14 and aim that COP15 and the policy will be about transformative change. What does that transformative change mean? 
one of the elements of that, the structural change that needs to, to happen is indeed the recognition that nature provides solutions to so many multiple, um, uh, multiple crises, in a way, including, including climate change. Um, we also see, and uh, uh, more and more so in recent months, a growing attention from global leaders, from uh, top politicians and heads of states, but also to business coalitions, um, many of them uh, coming together, recognizing that the biodiversity crisis, the climate change crisis are existential crises to their businesses and committing to take action along the supply chains. We, we have seen that in the context of the G7 with a number of, of uh, coalitions of, of great businesses coming forth to um, express their commitment and, and commit indeed also to the uh, Secretary General uh, Climate Summit. And lastly, I think what, what this has done is also opening a lot more the conversation on the uh, economic transformation and on the finance. Again, the resource mobilization is it's an element that is critical, as we heard, um, for the new policy. But now, by looking transversally, in a way, by addressing nature as, as, a, as an investment, as a, uh, an investment that has a return, not only monetary, but in health, in well-being, in, in mental health, in spirituality, it is a dimension that uh, perhaps was not further explored in communities outside our own, um, our own community. So I think what this nature-based solution track embedded in the, nine, in the other nine tracks in the climate, um, Secretary General's Climate Summit, which obviously will attract um, high attention from the world um, it's doing, is it's um, casting the pathway towards also COP15. From a CBD perspective, uh, our our maybe a little um, pragmatic approach with this track was um, to, to try to see how we can, we can use any, um, any conversation, any element of, um, of the climate uh, community to really bring in the messages for biodiversity. And that was one of them because it was harder to imagine a, a biodiversity summit uh, though now we have that as well, we'll have next year, as you know, uh, a nature summit, and uh, we are very excited that that's going to happen. So the pathway now between, between the Secretary General Climate Summit and leading all the way to COP15 will mean multiple um, milestones and elements, including the IUCN, uh, well, I don't know why I'm pointing to Inger when I speak about the IUCN, <laughs> including the IUCN Congress, uh, to really keep this momentum growing and to, to keep building the, 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 well, there's a snowball effect, if you want. Um, so in that context, our ask, uh, as part of the steering committee was, and in every message that we gave, was that please, please do not stop your thinking at the Secretary General Climate Summit. And don't forget that there is a lot more to come because we have seen from experience, you know, we have great successes in, in these forums and in these events, and then sometimes the next day, um, a lot of people return to business as usual. So our aim there was to really connect what's happening in the Climate Summit with what will need to happen in the Nature Summit next year and what will happen in, in Kunming, and to make these various and multiple actors um, understand that there is a whole process here and also um, that there is an opportunity for them to not stop the action now with the coalitions with the, these 160 initiatives, but actually build on them and bring them forward as commitments to COP15. Um, the, you, know, you know very well that we have uh, this initiative on the Sharm el Sheikh to Beijing to Kunming action agenda for nature and people. Um, it's something that uh, you, the parties, have decided to adopt in, uh, in uh, COP14. And um, I think a lot of these actions, 160, could be further developed and be part in this of, of um, uh, groundswell movement of action for nature, but in a broader context, for nature as solution to climate, to livelihoods, to health, to well-being, to so many crises. So, um, that's, that's why we are, we are really excited that those messages were taken on board, that there was so much success from the, from the leadership of the two countries here. Um, we have talked to um, other, other permanent representatives in New York to 
to make sure that this energy will continue and they will use it also in, um, in, um, to help the Nature Summit next year to be a great success and evidently to arrive at COP15 with, uh, with an agenda, with a policy that is transformative, that is ambitious and that can in real time and in real practice uh, help us address some of uh, some of the crises that we are facing. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to, to uh, be part of this. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christiana, for helping to lead the way. Um, so we can, we, we recognize now that there's um, some of our panelists and some of you that need to step out now for other commitments. And so um, f please feel free to do that before we end. I just want to have one more uh, round of appreciation for all of our panelists and then we'll go into discussions. So to begin the conversation, uh, there's, a, uh, there's, there's a few of the champions that uh, really um, have been uh, tremendously um, powerful as leaders under the Nature-Based Solutions work stream. And so for our, um, so I, it's my honor to give the floor to one of the great champions for nature-based solutions, Costa Rica. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, stay in the, in the room. Uh, I come very often to this room and I never saw so many people here. So I am very happy to, to participate in this panel, which is uh, very important. Uh, allow me first to thank you uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. And thank you to China and New Zealand for the inspired words. And uh, it, it seems that uh, nature-based solutions is becoming the queen of, of the environment and the queen of nature. So I am happy with that because we are talking about uh, uh, biodiversity and, and nature uh, solutions for a long time, but it never has the opportunity to be the queen of the, of the nature and the environment. And I am happy to, to participate in this forum. Uh, it has become uh, apparent over the last few years that nature-based solutions are critical for climate change mitigation and adaptation, and not only for climate change, we need to, to see uh, more in a big picture, which is also to include pollution, chemicals and waste, their certification, biodiversity laws, and for everything that we do every day, we need a, a nature-based solutions are critical. For example, when you see the IPCC 1.5 degree report from 2018, it stated very clearly that we are running off time. And we all know that we are running off time. To avoid dangerous climate change, we must peak emissions by 2020, bring emissions to zero by about 2050, and then generate negative emissions until the end of the century if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. And we only have a carbon budget equivalent to about 12 years of emissions and current levels within, within which to achieve this global decarbonization process. We are in a climate emergency, in a climate crisis. So to have any chance of ensuring a climate safe future, we must eliminate fossil fuels and we must do quickly as possible. But that is, that is not enough in our perspective. 
is not enough. We must also protect and restore ecosystem. We must do that. This is because why there are fast carbon stocks in ecosystems. In fact, there is far more carbon in terrestrial ecosystems, for example, 2,000 gigatons, than there is currently in the atmosphere, about 800 gigatons. Forests alone store more than carbon 860 gigatons. The dung is currently in the atmosphere and more carbon than there is known coal and oil reserves. So even if we eliminate fossil fuels, we will still face dangerous climate change. If we do, if we do not protect ecosystem carbon stocks, we are failing in our goals. Another point that I, I would like to raise is we also need to harness the huge potential of ecological restoration to draw down carbon out, the, out of the atmosphere. We have clear, cleared or degraded ecosystem around the world, but ecological restoration can remove huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. For example, it could be maybe 40% of more of annual carbon emissions can be removed by ecosystem conservation. And one question, so where do we begin? This is the question. The top priority is to ensure the protection of our primary ecosystem, for example, primary forest, but also grassland, wetlands, etc. So primary forests are the priority because they contain far more carbon than degraded forest. They also contain most biodiversity, much more than in degraded forest. Carbon stock in primary forests are also the fastest the safest because primary forests and other primary ecosystems are more stable. They are more resistant to change and more resilient when we change does occur. The reason carbon stocks are the largest and the safest in primary forests is precisely because primary forests still retain all uh, of their biodiversity. In other words, one of the points that I want to raise is, in other words, biodiversity and ecosystem are fundamentally linked with climate change mitigation. Next, we should rely on ecological restoration of degraded forests as much as possible. Allowing a degraded forest to recover provides the best and fastest way to maximize both carbon and also biodiversity. Third, we should allow forests to regenerate where it has been clear. If the forest can regenerate naturally without active intervention of humans, that is the cheapest uh, and most efficient solution that nature can give to us. So in cases, for example, the active re uh, restoration is, is very important. In, in natural regeneration is preferable that only you know to plant uh, trees because it's more integrated in the ecosystem. And I am coming to, to, to the last to say, what is Costa Rican doing? Costa Rican is, uh, has launched a decarbonization plan relying on wind and geothermal energy. We are 100% uh, a country which is using renewable energy. And I think other countries need to follow this example from a very small country to use their own nature-based solutions, mountains and rivers, to provide a solution for the communities that are living there and they are agree to use their resource in a sustainable manner to get economical and also to reach the protection of the environment. And Another point that Costa Rica is doing is the protection and creating new parks and protected areas. 
we have few, uh, many examples in, in Costa Rica where protected areas are key for our ca carbon uh, production. And one of the things that Costa Rica really we complain is that we are getting very low prices in our, our carbon tax. So we need to, to be paid more for our carbon tax. Uh, ecological restoration, allowing degradate forests to recover and allowing forests to re regenerate where it has been clear. One of the samples of Costa Rica is that Costa Rica went from 25 forests covered in years 80. It was half of the, of the of the cover of the land was without forest, and we triple. We, we come to 50% cover today, and our target is to get to have a set of goal of 60% forest cover by 2030. Costa Rica is doing this part uh, through a payment for ecosystem services. And this system is working. Costa Rica is, is um, a leader, you know, in, in, in innovation of, of trying to, to have uh, policies putting in place that we can uh, achieve the SDG sustainable goals with nature-based solutions, but also to uh, engage the community, the people, the indigenous people, all people who are living in, in Costa Rica are very aware about how we need to protect the environment to get also economical benefit and to develop as a country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's wonderful to see the room still so full and also to remind that we have a global audience through our web, web stream. Um, I have a request from Egypt. Thank you, Chair. Right here. Uh, well, I was following uh, quite carefully uh, the uh, uh, presentation by the leadership of China and New Zealand on nature-based solutions. Thank you so much for the valuable information that you have presented to us. My question actually uh, is, do you have a concrete proposals that it will be tabled during the initiative uh, on the 21st of September? Because I didn't hear about projects or something that it is already uh, connected to ambition level for the nature-based solution. So uh, I would really appreciate if you have something uh, on that to tell us about. Thank you. Um, so we've, as I said, we've, we've produced a, a manifesto, which is, is really the, the invitation for countries, various countries to produce proposals for the climate summit. Um, and then countries like New Zealand and China uh, and others will be putting forward um, proposals for the summit. So it's up to, it's up to individual countries to, uh, to make commitments. Um, and I guess this is, uh, this is one of the reasons we're all here tonight, is, is to urge, urge you, um, and I acknowledge fully that I think in this room we must be preaching to the converted, right? Um, to urge you to take the call back to your countries uh, to join that commitment and bring ideas to the table um, on the 23rd of September but also to remember that that's just a beginning. Okay, we'll go on to the next comment. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm from Egypt. And uh, I would like to thank the co-chairs. And of course, all of us know 
that addressing biodiversity loss, climate change, and ecosystem degradation are the challenges of this century. And they are closely interlinked, and they have to be addressed jointly if we are to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Achievement, and the Global Biodiversity Framework, whether the current one or the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, that these issues will have to be addressed jointly, not in silos. A coherent approach would ensure that climate change impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems are reduced and that biodiversity and the ecosystems could contribute to climate mitigation and adaptation and resilience, as has been mentioned uh, by others as well. It is possible with nature-based approaches to combine measures that can simultaneously protect or restore biodiversity and ecosystems, remove or reduce emissions of atmospheric greenhouse gases, and could contribute to restoration of degraded land and ecosystems. In fact, at the 14th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in Sharm el Sheikh, an initiative entitled A Coherent Approach for Addressing Biodiversity Loss, Climate Change, Land and Ecosystems Degradation Using Nature Based Approaches was launched by, Egypt, by the Egyptian president. And I'm very surprised that even the executive secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity was, that was in Sharm el Sheikh did not mention this. We already embarked on its implementation in collaboration with UNEP and ICN and others. In fact, uh, uh, last Sunday, the Egyptian president at the group of seven meeting uh, 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 brought to the initiative to the attention of the meeting and requested support to the initiative and to nature-based solution. And we look forward to collaborate with the co-chairs of this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Norway? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, I wanted to, to thank China and New Zealand for their great leadership on nature-based solutions. Of course, uh, um, I, I would prefer the, the term um, biodiversity-based solutions, being a CBD guy, but um, no, that was on a more humoristic note. Uh, some, some brief remarks. Um, much has been said already, but given the very alarming situation we are in now, uh, part particularly in the Amazon, enhanced efforts for the rainforest will be a central topic at the Climate Action Summit. And this is absolutely critical also for biodiversity targets. And many rainforest leaders are showing leadership and stepping up their efforts, and we believe it's important to recognize those, and we hope that all others will follow. We also need the continued contribution of indigenous peoples and civil society and wish to recognize their critical role. And private sector also have a key role to play in addressing the drivers of biodiversity loss and supporting sustainable production. And we hope they will strengthen their efforts as well. We know many are already sending strong signals that they wish to have sustainable um, supply chains including deforestation-free supply chains. And one of the most important measures we can make as leaders is to actively support deforestation-free supply, supply chains, holistic land use planning, and stop illegal logging and environmental crime. And so we welcome a dialogue on how we can do more together on this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you. I saw Pakistan and then IUCN. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, i just like to take the opportunity to share with our colleagues an ambitious initiative that the Ministry of uh, Climate Change of Pakistan has uh, taken and is actively working on it. But first of all, I would like to congratulate you for organizing this event. And um, before further ado, I want to reiterate that Pakistan welcomes UN Secretary General's initiative 
to convene the Climate Action Summit in September 2019 in New York. And Pakistan supports all the efforts in this regard. The issue is very close to our heart, and I feel glad to tell you that Pakistan is going to present a new initiative in this regard. It is called Sustainable Growth, Livelihoods, and Ecosystem Restoration. The initiative draws on the concept of ownership, financial contribution, adaptation, and reconfiguration of the economic growth model that reduces reliance on fossil fuels while overcoming environmental degradation. The initiative will act as an additional and concrete component of Pakistan's review of our NDCs. This initiative builds on Pakistan's earlier successful initiative to plant billion trees, which is popularly called Billion Trees Afforestation Project in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in 2015. The outcomes of that initiative have been duly acknowledged by United Nations Environment Program, the Bond Challenge, and other international bodies and fora. Following the success, Pakistan has now set a goal of 10 billion tree plantation across Pakistan, and the process has already started. This new initiative has core objectives, basically four core objectives. Number one, facilitating transition towards environmentally resilient Pakistan by mainstreaming adaptation and mitigation through ecologically target, targeted initiatives covering afforestation, biodiversity conservation, enabling and enhancing policy environment consistent with objectives outlined in Pakistan's NDCs. Number two, integrating economic policy, growth and poverty alleviation with efforts at reducing emissions, increasing, increasing sink capacity and enha enhancing resilience within and across forestry, agriculture, oceans, and food systems, including through biodiversity, conservation, leveraging supply chains, and technology. And number three is attaining land degradation neutrality by restoring at least 30% of degraded forest, 5% of degraded cropland, 6% of degraded grassland, and 10% of degraded wetlands by 2030 to generate ecosystem services and provide additional support to mitigation of GHG in Pakistan. And number four point is engaging the private sector in promoting economy-wide efforts towards green growth. The initiative also seeks to establish an independent, transparent, and comprehensive financial mechanism to finance the projects and program under the initiative. This shall be an independent financial vehicle called Ecosystem Restoration Fund, for which Pakistan commits $50 million. World Bank mission has also visited Pakistan and identified three potential areas of our cooperation. Ultimately, we are hopeful that the initiative will promote biodiversity and mitigate land degradation, protect marine environment from land-based activities, ecological balance in food chains, overcome deforestation and establish forest economy, prevent high intensity floods through improved uh, flood water management, promote and establish sustainable blue economy, and ecologically responsible tourism in protected areas. The, the initiative is all set to be announced at the highest level during the upcoming United Nations Secretary General's Climate Action Summit. Uh, I will stop here, I can go on, but due to time constraint, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pakistan. Um, I would, given the time, I would propose that we have the IUCN and then the EU, and maybe just take, well, there's a lot of interest. We'll just take maybe one or two more before having some closing, opportunity for closing statements from China and New Zealand but we can also continue to have conversations even without the microphones. So IUCN and then EU. Thank you very much, Chair. My name is Jane Smart. I'm Global Director for IUCN's Biodiversity Conservation Group. We greatly appreciate the chance to make a few remarks about the role of nature-based solutions to enhance the synergies between climate change and biodiversity. And as Inga Anderson mentioned earlier on, this is a concept, nature-based solutions, that IUCN has been pushing for many years. And we really feel it's excellent that the UN Secretary General has identified nature-based solutions as a special track for this climate summit coming up in September. And we really would like to salute China and New Zealand for their fabulous leadership in this area. It's very timely. I think the really key point I would like to make is that 
Nature can provide over one third of the cost effective climate mitigation needed between now and 2030 to stabilize warming to below two degrees Celsius. Okay, let's put it another way. Nature can provide 30% of the fix to this massive climate emergency that, that we face. So investing in nature's infrastructure, the coral reefs, the mangroves, the forests, the wetlands, is absolutely critical for planetary security, for biodiversity, and the struggle against desertification and land degradation. And, of course, against climate change. And our colleague from Pakistan mentioned the Bond Challenge. And in fact, IUCN has been pushing the Bond Challenge over, over many years. Um, countries are pledging to restore areas, and so far pledges have been made for 170 million hectares of degraded and deforested land. And I'm really pleased to say that now these pledges are going from words into action. And I think with the adoption of the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, we're going to see great scaling up of, of this action. So it's all very timely, and I, I thank all those partners we've been working with for their fantastic leadership in, in this area. Um, we, we've really appreciated um, the commitments that everybody's um, making. So um, as I think many of you will know, um, some countries have already included nature-based solutions targets in their NDCs. For instance, and Costa Rica mentioned um, several of those, and it was great to hear those examples from Costa Rica. And the point I want to make, of course, and it has been made, but I, I, I want to emphasize, is, emphasize it. These commitments can deliver on the biodiversity targets as well. So if you map across to the IG targets, you can see that countries are hitting their IG target goals, if you like. They're meeting their IG targets at the same time as their, their, um, they're addressing the climate emergency. So now I think we need to, to ramp this up, and much more needs to be done. Um, a recent analysis by IUCN showed, for instance, that although 77% of NDCs submitted to date contain reference to forests, only 20% include quantifiable targets. You know, I think we can, we can do more in this area, and, and you know, the co-chairs are offering to help everybody do that. Um, Another point, of course, and I already mentioned this in a way, is, is nature-based solutions must go beyond forests. I mean, people never mention peatlands enough here. Um, wetlands, mangroves, coral reefs, they're all important. Um, and such ecosystems are underrepresented in these um, nationally determined contributions. I love the phrase from New Zealand at the beginning of the session, let's unlock the power, the potential of nature. So um, I would like to, um, from the IUCN perspective, um, also make a call for the biodiversity experts in the room to engage with their climate counterparts before the summit to import, point out the win-win, if you like, of the importance of including nature-based solutions as part of the um, planned response to the climate emergency. And this conversation, I think, in, again shows, and it's really coming out at this meeting, the, the need for the increased synergies between the CBD and the UNFCCC. And I would add the Desertification Convention to that. And I really wanted to pay tribute, actually, to the government of Egypt, who at COP14 really, I think, got this conversation going in a, in a very big way. I mean, obviously, um, the degradation of land, um, land degradation neutrality is a very big issue in Egypt, and therefore to link that to climate and, and biodiversity is, is, a, is great. But we needed a country to step up and, and take leadership, and, and, and Egypt did that. So thank you very much indeed um, for that. So um, Costa Rica mentioned you know, this climate emergence. I would, I would add that we've got a nature emergency as well as the climate emergency, and, and therefore to think about this win-win as we, go, as we think about the post-2020 biodiversity framework, just makes complete sense. And I think many of the parties here at this meeting have pointed out you know, the integration and alignment amongst the three Rio conventions and actually all the biodiversity-related conventions and beyond is absolutely essential to achieve the sustainable development goals and tackle these incredibly important crises. So IUCN very much looks forward to supporting this process, not only at the Climate Summit uh, later on, but also through the IUCN World Conservation Congress next year in, in Marseille, in France, in June. Please come 
and showcase these solutions. Um, and we also look forward, of course, to going to the CBD COP in China and pushing this still further. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I think if we, um, if, if the interventions are fairly short, I think we can fit th three more. So it would be the EU, Colombia, and then uh, the UK. Um, and then for the rest, I hope that I can, um, uh, perhaps one more in the back, then it will be the last one. Um, and then we will um, have the rest of the conversations we can just have um, after we close this session. Uh, the EU, please. Thank you very much, Susan. Indeed, uh, I will be brief. Just wanted to take the opportunity that this meeting is actually taking place in the headquarters of, of UNEP and, and also that this briefing involves representatives, the permanent representatives. Uh, I, I see there's a lot of colleagues of mine in, in this room. Uh, but let me first thank uh, for organizing it. It's very important to, to have this update uh, second in the row. And, and we, we have been briefed already in the CPR on the progress. and. Uh, congratulate uh, the, the co-leads, uh, China and New Zealand, on, on the efforts and tremendous work uh, put into the preparation um, of the summit and this track in particular. Um, I should also recognize that there is a number, a good number of EU member states that are engaged in different tracks of the climate change. So uh, we, we do support very much the, uh, the, the climate summit as well as the, uh, the track on the natural-based uh, solutions. Um, I should say that this meeting uh, was, was very inspiring uh, and uh, one, uh, one sense of it is uh, what the Executive Secretary of the CBD said, uh, that we are looking more and more into, into solutions and that brings me to, uh, to linking it to the UNEP mandate uh, that is uh, all about advocacy. Um, so uh, I would like to see that as we talk about the, the next steps from the, from the summit, uh, UNEP has a, a, a very concrete steps and very concrete mandates uh, that it can uh, undertake uh, and taking us further on, on actually uh, putting the, the, the great ideas and solutions into, into action. I uh, also wanted to say um, that as it was referred by, uh, by the executive director, um, in her re uh, reference to the EU definition that the EU is indeed embracing the concept of nat nature-based solutions. Uh, and one, one example is the international cooperation. And we are in a quite critical moment of setting the, the new framework uh, for the development of cooperation. And we look very seriously uh, into integrating biodiversity and nature-based solution into our development cooperation. Last thing I, I really want to say is that, um, as it was said um, uh, very pronouncedly by, by Costa Rica, but also by others, that uh, uh, the importance on um, protection of existing uh, ecosystems, uh, as well as the, the restoration. And uh, uh, that was actually IUCN who referred to the decade of uh, uh, restoration of ecosystems, I was quite, quite curious to ask this question, how, as we talk about the next steps, the, the roadmap bef uh, after uh, the climate summit, how this, uh, this discussion, nature-based solution, links to the, uh, the, the decade of restoration of ecosystems, and that question goes also very much to UNEP, who is one of the implementing agencies. So we are very interested to hear, hear more and also face uh, more action. Thank you. Thank you, EU. Um, Colombia, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, China and New Zealand, for this uh, wonderful initiative. Um, definitely your words inspire us. For Colombia as a mega diverse country, uh, the nature-based solution as an approach to improve the cost effectiveness of field interventions, as well as to strengthen synergies between climate change and biodiversity agendas. So a goal in this regards, in response to the driver associated with climate change 
would be a strategic for the post-2020 framework. We believe that nature-based solution is a right way to consolidate our development, development national plan that include the biodiversity as an important active of the nation. Uh, and this is our base for the sustainable development, which is the third uh, objective of the convention and is strategic, uh, strategic for uh, our development. So we are very, very happy to announce that Colombia has joined the initiative of Costa Rica in order to achieve the protection of the 30% of the Earth portion of the planet by 2030 within the framework of the next climate summit at the more uh, the high level. This commitment will be include um, our um, our 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 actions on uh, uh, IG, IG target 11 and takes into account not only the declaration of protected areas but also other measures, conservation or figures based on uh, areas. It is important to mention that we are trying to consolidate protected areas that already exist through, in, through, in, through an initiative um, called Herencia Colombia, Colombian Heritage, uh, that, uh, where we are working with the different uh, partners. And um, also we have uh, an important goals on restoration in those areas. So we hope to continue working hard together with all of you and, uh, and other partners in this path. So thank you so much. Thank you, Columbia. We welcome that. UK, please. Thank you very much. And, and I promise I won't take very long. I really just wanted to, um, uh, on behalf of the UK, express our thanks to the, to the panelists for giving us this debrief and for all the work that you've been doing on the nature-based solutions track. Um, as you know, the, the UK is leading another track at the, at the um, climate summit along with our, our colleagues from uh, Egypt. But we do think that the nature-based solutions track is a really important one. Um, we we, um, we very sort of view, we're viewing nature-based solutions as that really great opportunity to see the synergies between the climate change and the biodiversity um, angles of things. It's, it's, a, it's one of those really tangible areas where we can see how the, the two conventions, how the two areas really do operate together, but not just for climate change and biodiversity, which we see very much of, as two sides of the same coin, but also how work to, to um, uh, address the drivers of both climate change and biodiversity, they work together so you actually maximize the outputs that you get for the inputs. So we really do see nature-based solutions as a, as a really important vehicle, not only for you know, both climate and biodiversity, but also in, in development angles as well. So it really does capture the whole of the SDGs when you look at this as, a, as an approach going forward. Um, there will be lots of things that the UK will want to talk about, but I'm, I will leave my ministers to do that at the Climate Summit itself um, and save you um, some time this evening. But I think um, we would just like to say that it's, it's really great, the work that China and New Zealand have done here, and we do very much support it. And we'd also like to echo the words of, of both Inga and Christiana that this should just be a starting point. And actually, I think Super 2020 is a, a great opportunity that we really must make the use of. So thank you. Thank you, UK. Uh, so the final word goes to Kenya. And then I understand we have a short announcement from WCS before we invite uh, China and New Zealand to close. OK, thank you very much. I just want to appreciate the panelists and the experience I've shared, especially China and New Zealand. But I want to make an observation concerning the UN agents. I note that a number of us, a number of the UN agents share some common object, I mean goals, but they work in silos. Because when we think about UNFCCC, they use nature, they talk about nature to solve the problem. When you talk about UNDRR, they still appreciate nature as a good tool to address the issues. Uh, CBD, talking about nature. Even if we talk about uh, UNCCD, it's still talking about nature. Given that we have realized and uh, 
China and New Zealand have demonstrated that nature is a useful tool to address most of our problems. My question is, are we able to explore the possibility of using a coherence policy so that we can magnify? Like all of you know that if we, the scattered rays of the sun are too weak to start fire. But if you focus them using a magnifying glass, it takes seconds to start fire on a paper. So is there a way, and this is either a question or a recommendation, that UN agencies can explore ways to redefine their mandate and see if they can focus their expertise and resources to use nature to unlock the power that it has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenya. Uh, announcement from WCS, and then we'll go to our co-leads. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society. We're headquartered in New York, work in 60 countries around the world. We subscribe to everything that's been said. And as Soma mentioned, we're very much, I think we're all on board with this. The important thing is that this message come loud and clear to the Climate Summit and the events thereafter. Two very quick announcements. Uh, one is that we're one of the founding members of a coalition with the various environmental groups called Nature for Climate. I invite you to see on the website. One of the things we've done is analyzed the nature-based solutions and how much they can contribute to the Paris contributions. Pretty much every country is coming down short, with a few exceptions, and we, I think there's tremendous opportunities. We've tried to quantify those, and, we're, and they'll also give tools and methodologies and examples of what could be done. But the second thing is we realized that of those 160 submissions, many of them would not be able to be discussed or presented in the summit itself. So one of the things we're doing is organizing a side event during the UN summit from the 23rd to the 25th called Nature Hub. We're gonna convene most of the practitioners around this. I wanna invite everyone here to join us in New York for that event where we can come and continue this conversation and look at specific examples of implementation and execution. Happy to give you more details. Thank you very much. Uh, tremendous uh, comments and reflections. Thank you so much. Uh, great questions. Uh, certainly appreciate the issue in terms of um, breaking down the silos uh, related to nature across the UN agencies and, and ensuring that we're bringing all our strengths together. Uh, I'd like to ask for a closing uh, for comments from uh, China and New Zealand. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for the active participation. Uh, here I would like to say that the uh, ecosystem has attracted uh, worldwide attention. And uh, in fact, the uh, ecosystem itself uh, has uh, a, the function of uh, uh, mitigation, adaptation of climate change, and it also has uh, a self-restoration ability. And the nature-based solutions will like call for the governments, uh, international organizations, and also private sectors to work together to protect and to rest restore uh, the, the uh, ecosystem uh, and also play a very important role to, de uh, to a, the a achievement of the 1.5 degree uh, purpose. 这个我相信明年在中国昆明举办的靠谱事务 and I am confident that uh, during COP15 next year in Kunming, we can definitely work together to achieve the purpose of making this uh, uh, ambitious uh, global biodiversity framework, uh, which will help uh, or promote the nature itself 
to uh, display its e effectiveness in, in protecting uh, nature and also uh, uh, mitigate and adapt to climate change. 当然我们也别忘了基于自然的解决方案是气候变化工约的一个新的一个工作机制我们也应该利用好气候变化成熟的各其他各种机制如资金机制执行机制等促进生物脏性工约特别是二零二零后生物脏性框架的实施 uh, at the same time, I would like to share with uh, everybody here that uh, we should not forget that uh, nature-based solution is a solution or is an initiative coming from uh, climate change. Uh, at the same time, besides these nature-based solutions, we should also learn from other uh, good practices and working mechanism under climate change, such as uh, uh, financial mechanism and also implementation mechanism. These, are, these all will help to contribute uh, the, the uh, purposes or the objectives of uh, uh, the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity. So I look forward to meeting all of you. Uh, September Climate Summit in New York. Thank you. New Zealand, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, look, it, it's been clear, really clear from the discussion tonight that there are lots of ideas and action um, out there. And I want to really acknowledge the work of others um, China, obviously, but um, New Zealand and China are co-leading this process in which there are many countries and other actors, and we've heard from a number of them tonight. Um, I think it's really important that uh, we acknowledge that it's not only countries as well, but it's other organizations, it's businesses, um, a number of other actors. Let's make sure that we all continue to work together on this to leave behind the right kind of legacy for our children. Thank you. Well, a great appreciation to our panelists, uh, particularly the co-lead countries on this nature-based solutions effort. Um, to all of you, thank you for your comments. We look forward to working with you, um, as well as those who are joining us through web streaming. Um, you will be receiving more information about uh, the manifesto and all of the opportunities that we have to continue this energy and to be working forward to the Climate Summit and beyond. Thank you so much. <laughs>